Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is another edition of Fresh Red Kills. So Fresh Red Kills is where I talk about the books that I have recently read. Um, so I got two, two nonfiction uh, history books that I read for Historathon 2023, a year-long event where myself and some great co-hosts and also uh, many terrific participants, uh, we are all reading and celebrating and talking about nonfiction history throughout the year 2023. And we have divided up the year into four quarters. Um, each quarter representing a different time period in history. So the first quarter, January, February, March, um, is prehistory up to 500 CE. So this falls in line for a good portion of that, <laughs> um, the, or at least this book falls in line with that uh, for a good portion of it. And this certainly does, a uh, book on Alexander the Great. So I'm going to talk about these uh, fairly briefly, just give my thoughts on them. Uh, so the first one I read was A Short History of Drunkenness, how, Why, Where, and When Humankind Has Gotten Merry from the Stone Age to the Present uh, by Mark Forsyth, um, who seems to run a uh, some kind of, looks like a blog. Um, it's, uh, what's it called here? Sorry. Um, I'm not seeing it. I thought it was on here. Oh, The Inky Fool, I guess is what it's it's known as. Yeah, but it's, um, I guess he's kind of a, a little bit of a word nerd, um, which is great. And this is a, it's a swift, uh, humorous, but also pretty informative look at the way humans have consu consumed, um, consumed alcohol, uh, been affected by it, how governments have treated it. Uh, some governments, of course, trying to suppress it uh, because it's a threat to the social order. Others uh, that actually promoted it um, in order to gain things like uh, you know, tax revenue for alcohol. Um, and he goes really, he does, he, he's true to his word, he goes from the Stone Age all the way up to the present day. Um, and there are some, there are some illustrations throughout, his own illustrations. Uh, they mostly disappear actually by like the second half of the, uh, of the book, but some of them were pretty humorous. This one I found quite humorous here. Uh, it says, detail from the tomb of Neferhotep circa uh, 1300 BC. The lady on the left is a servant holding a wine vessel. The lady on the right is drunk, in case you couldn't figure that out yourself. Um, and this is filled with a uh, you know, kind of dry humor. Uh, he is British. It's kind of that very British dry humor that I really like. Uh, little hints of sarcasm here and there. Uh, but no, the, the topics, um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just some of these, uh, these civilizations. You've got the prehistory of drinking, um, Sumerian bars, uh, drinking in the Bible. We've got uh, the Dark Ages, the Viking Sumbel. Um, don't know if I'm pronouncing that quite right. Uh, things about the neat medieval alehouse, the gin craze, the Wild West saloon. He's got a whole chapter on the saloons. Uh, one of the really interesting chapters was uh, Russia uh, and how they how they treated vodka. But um, yeah, this was really fun. Uh, I expected it to be fun, but it was actually way more fun and informative than I was even expecting it to be. It's certainly a popular history. Uh, I don't think there's much in the way at all of a, so got a bookmark stuck in the back there, of notes, right? No. Oh, there's a little bit. There's something of a bibliography. It's not very extensive, though. Uh, but no, I, if you're somebody who wants some humor, wants a light read, and uh, maybe likes to partake here and there of the uh, the happy sauce, I would certainly uh, strongly recommend this. I really had a great time with this. And then I read Paul Cartledge's uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, this is my first Paul, Paul Cartledge book, and this this cover doesn't show the subtitle. You have to go into the inside flap in order to see the subtitle. And the subtitle is The Hunt for a New Past. Uh, which is kind of interesting because it is it is this idea that he's trying to use to tie this book together. Um, he's basically trying to understand Alexander the Great and get his character. Like, what kind of person really was he? Now, this was certainly an informative read. I learned a lot, but it also was a little bit frustrating. Um, this was originally conceived really as, uh, or I should say it began as his lectures, um, various lectures. So what we have here are different chapters about Alexander, but they're thematic. 
um, and they don't always follow a chronological order. And Cartledge does assume that the reader already has a pretty solid understanding of Alexander's biography. So, you know, my own relationship with, with Alexander, um, I had read a lot about him maybe about 20 years ago or so. Uh, whenever, it was right before um, the Alexander film came out by Oliver Stone. And I knew enough about Alexander to watch that movie and not have any surprises. Like, I pretty much knew what was coming up. But I haven't thought a lot about Alexander since then. Uh, and I've forgotten a lot. So I was actually hoping this to kind of get a little bit of a refresher. But I found myself sometimes getting more and more confused. Um, because he bounces around the timeline quite often. And it's not always clear in my mind, you know, where these events sit in Alexander's life. Um, and we're being introduced to people quite often uh, that I don't know the context in which these people existed inside Cartledge's, uh, you know, um, sorry, inside Alexander's biography. Uh, and this also has another effect. Um, because each chapter was kind of conceived on its own in certain ways and began as a lecture, we get a lot of re repetition. Uh, he, there's a lot of times where he's repeating the same thing over and over again. And we also have him spending more time on subjects that we wouldn't expect and not on the really big events. Like Gogamila gets kind of, you know, pretty short treatment, but we hear a lot about the destruction of Thebes um, by Alexander because he's he keeps going back to it from various points that he's making. Uh, now, so I would not recommend this for a beginner to Alexander. Um, and, you know, it's whoever goes into this really needs to know their stuff. Uh, going back to that um, that subtitle, uh, The Hunt for a New Past, one of the keys that he believes um, to understanding Alexander is Alexander and hunting. Uh, you know, it was incredibly important to Alexander. It was a major feature in Macedonian life. But that maybe seeks to explain a lot of Alexander's motivations. He enjoyed the hunt. Um, so, you know, Alexander is somebody who has had uh, very very large opinions across the spectrum uh, about him. You know, some people vilifying him. I think many more admiring him. And to Carlage's credit, he is kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, he is absolutely willing to um, admit the fact that, you know, there was some military genius with Alexander. But you certainly get the feeling that Carlage doesn't really care for him as a character that much. Um, his megalomania, uh, sometimes his, you know, very intense cruelty. Uh, he, you know, his... Uh, his unstoppable, um, you know, devotion to his own promotion. Uh, so, you know, you kind of you kind of get the sense that Paul Cartledge isn't exactly an Alexander fan. Um, and I have to say, I, I kind of agree with that, and I was already in agreement with that before I read this. Um, one of the reasons I haven't read much about Alexander in the past, you know, two decades, really, is uh, he's just not that... It, it's not that he's not interesting, um, I've always been kind of put off by him a little bit. Uh, I've read other, about other conquerors and, you know, um, different, you know, military geniuses. And some of them I just kind of get along with more. Um, I could read nonstop about Hannibal Barca. Uh, there's something about him that, you know, I, I don't want to say likable, but there's something more relatable about, about Hannibal when you read about him. Um, even though I know the stuff we have about him is limited. Uh, but... Alexander, he just, he just kind of rubs me the wrong way. Um, <laughs> he's not the kind of person that, even if he wasn't a conqueror, I don't think I'd want to be in a room with for very long. Uh, and even his group, um, they kind of come off as the, uh, you know, the, the, the popular kids in school that, uh, you know, basically have a reign of terror across their, against their classmates. That's kind of what he reminds me of a little bit. Um, and maybe Hannibal Barca is a little bit more the, uh, the underdog trying to take on the, uh, <laughs> trying to take on those, um, those popular kids. I'm not sure exactly what it is in my mind that makes me like one much more than the other, but um, Alexander just hasn't really interested me that much, and I was hoping that this book would kind of spark that interest. It would, you know, bring me into really wanting to dive deep into the world of Alexander, and it kind of doesn't. Um, again, that's not entirely Carlage's Car fault. I mean, Part of it, I did have a hard time, like I said, getting into the book at times because of its structure, uh, because of the thematic structure rather than chronological structure. You know, his purpose is not to really recount his biography. His purpose is to um, examine the character. Although, once again, it's it's not really clear when you're looking at the cover about that. Uh, that's really what it is. Uh, there are plenty of images throughout. Some really great ones. 
Um, I really appreciated those. And what I, I actually started really getting to the book towards the end. Uh, we have the a section on the final years, Alexander the Man. We looks at him more personally. Um, the last kind of official chapter is Legends and Legacies of Alexander, um, which is a little more of a, a little more of a historiography. Uh, and then he really gets into the historiography of the ancient sources uh, with a, an appendix called Sources of Paradox, uh, where he basically explains the various primary sources that we have for Alexander, um, what, uh, you know, what he was able to use, how he was able to use them, the ones that we can maybe trust and not, and how he goes about figuring out what we can trust. Uh, I really like that whole last section there. So I didn't end up liking the book more and more as it went, but I did find, I guess, the first half a little bit more frustrating because of how much it was bouncing around, and I wasn't quite sure what Cartledge sometimes was trying to get at with that. But anyhow, I'm glad I read it, and certainly going to keep it on my shelf. It's maybe something I'll return to at some point in the future if I read another biography of Alexander, um, but if you're new to the subject, I would not start here. Uh, so anyhow, those are the two books that I most recently finished. We got a short history of drunkenness, which is and fun, swift, uh, and highly recommended. And Alexander the Great by Paul Cartledge, which mm, you just got to know what you're you're getting into with this. But still, Cartledge, I highly respect him. He obviously has a terrific grasp of the historiography of the sources. Um, it's just not a book that I entirely meshed with. That's all. Uh, but if you've read either of these, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And as always, thank you, BookTube.